Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at how we can record our data and how we can graph our data during an experiment. So what we're going to start with is we're going to revisit that rosebush, <laughs> rosebush, aphid, and oil experiment that I've been talking about in my last two videos on the scientific method. And uh, so we put 40 aphids onto each of our three control, like experimental groups with the different temperatures of coconut oil. We have our 25 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, and 35 degrees Celsius. Now, we need to set up a chart, though, on how we can record our data uh, and our observations. So we want to make sure we include uh, a category for 25 degrees, 30 degrees, and 35 degrees. We want to write down how many aphids we started with and how many we ended with after an hour, like after spring, like how many died. Right, so we do that for each of our three uh, groups. And uh, so if we start with 40 in each of the, of the temperatures, we want to write down how much we have surviving or remaining. You could also likely write down how many died if you're able to find them on the ground, right? So here, um, if this was all we did, we would see that the 35 degrees Celsius killed the most aphids. There's only 22 remaining, which means that 18 died. Whereas in the 25 degrees Celsius, only 13 died. There's 27 remaining. So you might stop here and draw some conclusions that the most effective oil temperature was 35 degrees Celsius, which is actually rejecting our hypothesis. And that's okay. Sometimes that happens in science. However, uh, this isn't the most convincing data. In science, if you have the opportunity and the resources, it's best to repeat your experiment and confirm it. Um, run multiple trials. And so therefore, the more data you have, the more convincing and reliable your data and your conclusions are. So when you look at this, we would find after five trials, our average. So at 25 degrees Celsius, um, we had an average of about 25 aphids remaining or 15 dying. At 30 degrees Celsius, it was 24.6. And then at 35 degrees Celsius, you have 23.6. And if you look at any one of these individual trials at a time, like for example, look at the fifth trial. At the fifth trial, it would look like the um, 30 degrees Celsius was the most reliable at killing off aphids, right? If you look at trial number three, it looks like 25 degrees Celsius was the best at getting rid, rid of aphids. So it's important to repeat your experiment as many times as you can uh, in order to have a more accurate depiction of what the results are. Okay, so when we look at how do we graph this though? So we have some information here and we have some data. So we're going to set up our graph and when we do this, we're going to place the independent variable on the x-axis. So in our experiment here, what was the independent variable? Good, it was temperature. So we're gonna put our three different uh, temperature groups on the x-axis. Now, the dependent variable is what goes on the y-axis. So what is the dependent variable here? Right, it's the number of aphids remaining at the end of one hour. So um, when we do this, we wanna make sure when you set up your scale on your uh, y-axis that your numbers even on the X2, if it applies, you want to make sure that they are evenly distributed throughout. So here I chose to go by fives, but you could go by ones, twos, threes, whatever. But I went 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So then I graph it. Now when I graph these, I'm using a bar graph because I'm representing an average for a group uh, over time. Now if I look at this, some people might say, oh, 25 degrees was the highest bar and therefore the best temperature at getting rid of aphids. Now, in truth, this is where statistical analysis comes into play uh, in analyzing graphs. Here you would calculate standard error and you would see um, if there is actually a significant difference uh, between these three groups, okay? Uh, so anyway, so depending on your class or why you're watching this video, um, you might have more to apply to this graph. Okay, so let's check our understanding here. Uh, what is the dependent variable in this graph? Okay. So we look at the x-axis and we look at the y. And we remember the dependent variable is found on the y-axis. 
So here it would be rate of transpiration. Uh, on this one, the independent variable in this graph, we think, okay, independent variable is the x-axis and the dependent variable is the y-axis. So here temperature is our independent variable. Now in this graph, what is the dependent variable? You're like, okay, okay, dependent variables are going to be the y-axis. So even if you have no idea what the graph is, you still know dependent variables are on the y, and the answer here would be temperature anomaly. Okay, so I just want to make one more point on how to correctly set up your graph. So let's pretend there was an experiment on the average height. I'm sorry, like they did five experimental groups of plants, and they found the average height of each group. And here is our data, 63, 51, 78, 4, and 16. Okay, so first we're going to set up our independent variable. So we want to think about, well, what is the independent variable? All we know is that there was five experimental groups. So here there were five different treatments done. We don't know what they were, um, but we know that there were five different experiments on this plant, whether it was nutrients or fertilizer, water, sunlight, uh, etc. Okay. So there's your x-axis. Now for your y, the little setup does say height, the average height. So that is being measured. That is our dependent variable. So the height will go on the y-axis. Now, this is a common mistake I see from my students. It's very like a, it happens in all levels, from 9th to 12th graders. Um, they take the numbers and they write them exactly like this on the y-axis. Right, so they're telling me that in group number four, the height was only four. In group five, it was 16. And so they're trying to be exact. But this is not a good way to label your axes. You wanna have your axis evenly distributed with numbers. In this one, because we're going from low, four, all the way up to almost 80, that's a wide range of numbers. So it, it works best to maybe go by 20s or by 10s um, in this uh, graph here. Okay, so make sure your axes are always evenly distributed um, on the Y, and then if it applies, on the X. For example, on the X, I'm going to go back one slide. Like here for the years at the bottom, they went by 20 um, uh, year increments. And so, except for from 1880 to 1900, that's 40 years. That's a kind of not very good right there. Uh, but you want to also have even increments uh, if it applies on your X axis. Okay, good job, guys.